Test, test. Test, test. Cool. Who's with us today? Shady Niggy. Hey, how's it been going, man? You've been busy this week. Tony, you too. Alright, I have a couple things I want to work on on eShop on web. And then I want to switch gears probably back to Regix Live. Which is right there. Hey, I just went live. Uh, hey, how's it going? So, let's uh, let's start with eShop on web. Um, I don't have any issues tracking what I want to do, except for the big issue of doing Blazor. But, I have all my tests passing, and I have this new public API folder, and it has endpoints for create, delete, get, list, all this good stuff, and authenticate, which is nice, and all that works. Um, let's close all but this. Hey Melvin, how's it going? Happy Friday. Most of you probably, if you're in the US, this might be a holiday for you. It is for my company. So I'm doing this on my day off, as it were. Not that I really get days off. Um, Alright, so somewhere I have a update thing that's uh, over here that I want to implement. Where's the actual API? So here's what the request looks like. Alright, so I want to take this create, which has associated requests and response as an endpoint. Uh, it's using my API endpoints library. And I'm going to create one that does updates. Um, because the end goal is to be able to create an admin page that updates these catalog items. So if you haven't seen eShop on web, let me show that real quick just so you see what we're working on. Set that as startup. Launch it. Of course, it's in the wrong screen, but uh, here it is. All right, so we want to be able to edit these products in here. Um, so I need an update endpoint on my uh, API. And so back to Visual Studio, I already have create, delete, uh, get by ID and list, um, and I just need updates. So we're going to start with, let's say, uh, same as create, basically. We'll just grab this and paste that in here and call it update. And it's going to need an update request, and it's going to have an update response. And then we can just throw that into its own file, like this. Alright, and then that's now here, and it doesn't have any associated files with it, so we're going to take this one as a request, uh, and let's just paste it right here and call it update. Now when we go to update one of these things, we're going to need to know its ID as well. So we'll say public int ID. I made it change my mind and decided I want the ID off the route, in which case I might have to decorate this, but let's uh, start with that, move that to its own place. Now you notice here, in Visual Studio, these two things aren't linked together, like the create ones are. I want them to be linked, so all I'm going to do is rename this to start with update, dot, like that. And now Visual Studio knows those go together, and so it'll chain them together. Now response is basically just going to be the catalog item, um, and I'm going to copy this verbatim. So we'll just take that paste it here, make it update, which means i got to do that in a couple places, like that, and then I'll do the same thing, move this to its own file, and then rename that file to prefix it with update dot. I don't know of a faster, easier way to do that, but now update should work, it does, uh, and we're ready to implement it, it's an abstract class, so we'll do that, and here's what it needs to do. Um, administrators is its auth requirement. That sounds good. Um, all right, Melvin asks. Actually, let me catch up on this. Friday fried with continuous meetings. Oh, that's horrible. Uh, I've been streaming for three minutes. Nice. Basic async endpoint class. What does that contain? Uh, basically, it ha contains this this endpoint to override. 
So let's go, we'll go look at that real quick. That's not it. This, uh, this one. Um, all right, so API end, end points. That one. Uh, let's go here. This Ardalis API endpoints library, which I'll paste in the chat, uh, is what I'm using. And it has a sample that goes with it, so you can see how it works. But in here, this uh, base async endpoint is what I'm using. And you'll see it is really tiny. So what does it do? Well, it inherits from controller base. That's ASP.NET Core controller base. It's abstract. It implements API controller for you. Um, and then the, uh, the base endpoint just takes in a, a response, uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, it takes a, a T response, um, and you can specify it like that, or you can do it with a request and a response here, which is what I'm using, and it just looks like this. So all it does is create an abstract handle async method with the appropriate types. Um, and that's it, right? It is a controller with one action method. Uh, that's, the whole, that's the whole thing. Uh, but the nice thing about this pattern is that now each one of your endpoints you can just reason about all by itself. And any dependencies it might need, like in this case I'm probably going to need a repository, uh, you can just keep those in that one endpoint and not have to have a ginormous controller with tons and tons of stuff going on. So we're going to take that and copy that there. We're going to come down here and this is going to say it updates a catalog item. And if you like that repo, go give it a star, because it can use more attention. It's slowly gaining popularity. All right, so there is catalog endpoints, update, da 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 That's all good. Pull in some more namespaces. Pull in some more namespaces. And we're good. Now let's see what else we need to steal from here. We're going to create a response. Actually, let's just take all of this for now and throw that in there creates and updates it turns out are actually really close to one another um, so we can create a new catalog item that's not exactly what we want we do want to create the response that part's good we're going to get the existing item so var existing item equals await and this needs to be async we're going to await on the repository dot get by id async of the request dot id and this thing should really be a put because it's an update and that's the appropriate verb um, now that we have the item we're going to update the item so instead of doing that we're going to say existing item dot description equals request dot description. And I'm not sure what all I want to update. Um, hmm. Will I let them change the brand and the type? Yeah, I probably will. So, so brand ID equals request dot brand ID. And if I wasn't going to let them do that, I should take those out of the request, obviously. Um, type ID. What you do to map the request to your domain, how you map them back to the entity. Uh, right now you're looking at it. I'm, I'm doing it by hand. Um, I could use AutoMapper uh, if I wanted to. Can you do a with? Uh, I never remember the syntax for with. I used to use with all the time in VB. Um, but I, I haven't uh, done that in forever here. So yeah, I could I could get rid of some of this verbosity of, of that or of that. Uh, or I could just use AutoMapper, right? Um, but for now, I think I'm okay. But why are these things all set is inaccessible. Ah, that's why. Alright. Existing item dot update name and price. Is that really all I can update? That's interesting. Let me go look at this catalog item real quick that I'm trying to update because it's not going to let me just do what I want to do. So okay. So I can change the name and I can change the price. Well let's go with that. Let's just say that's all we can change for now. We may have to uh, change that domain logic but but that makes this easier right we're not going to do any of those things we're going to say this is request.name this is request.price that's the only thing you're allowed to update 
Bam. Then we just need to save changes essentially, but I have a repository method for that called update async of this item. Which is kind of bogus because really all it does is save changes. But we'll do that and then we're done. And then this DTO needs to just take this existing item and do this. And that's some duplicated code now between a couple places where right? create and update both look real similar. So I would probably want to uh, make that a helper method, an extension method, an auto mapper, something. Uh, and then our response gets that and we return our response. The next response needs to be not a create, but an update response. All right, all right. So then we can test this out. And we can test it out with something like uh, Postman, which is a good place to start, um, or we can test it out in uh, Swagger, which I'll speak it. and ultimately we want to actually write some tests that will test this out when we run all our tests. So let's do Swagger first, that should be the easiest I think. So we'll set this as startup project, control F5, here's Swagger, we have the put endpoint now here, um, let's get our items. So I'll try out the get, and it's not going to run if I don't give it some kind of page, right? Yeah, it doesn't like that. So I need, I probably ought to have these default to something, honestly. But let's just say page size is 10, and try and execute that. And that works. All right, so now we've got, this is an existing item, ID 5. It has a name of Roslyn and a price of 8.5. We want to update those. So let's go to our put, ID 5. Remember ID5. I'm going to try it out. And thanks for the follow, uh, Abcam. Alright, so we're going to update ID5. Turns out we're not using any of these other things. We just want to update the name. Updated Roslyn Red Sheet thing. Price is now a dollar. And we expect this to fail. Why? Anybody know? Who's gonna who's following along? Who's gonna tell me why this is gonna fail before I click the button? Which branch of eShop containers the structure looks different from what's out there? This is eShop on web, so it's not eShop on containers. It's a much simpler single executable thing. JF Stern gets the prize, that's right, we haven't authenticated yet. So I, I put an authorized attribute on here just like create has. And when I execute, it has no idea who I am, so I'm gonna get a 401 telling me that I'm not authorized. Fortunately, I have implemented an authorization endpoint that will give me a JOT token, and I have authorization set up in Swagger. So we're going to authenticate, and we're going to come up here, and I, we got a 401 because it doesn't know who we are. All right. So we're going to go and we're going to say now we are demo user at Microsoft.com. Wow, is my CPU that busy? What's going on? Close some things. That's like a lot of delay on. Uh, like, I don't know why this is taking so long to catch up with me typing. I'm not typing that fast. I closed something that might have been hogging it, so hopefully it's better. All right, so we're going to authenticate, and then our super secret password is pass at word one. It's still really slow. What are you doing? I don't know what that lag is from. All right, let's execute that and see if I got it right. We did. We got a 200 request. We get true, so we're authorized. We're authenticated, rather. And uh, so here's our token. So we're going to copy that. And we come up here and we're going to authorize. And we're going to say, we have to type this in. You have to read. It says, type in bearer space and then the code. So bearer space paste authorize. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, shut that down. Now we're going to do this. And what's going to happen? Anybody? Is it going to work or not? I just did this earlier today in my Dev Better Mentoring program, so I know what the answer is. It is not going to work because now we get a different 400 error. Nope, shady. And eh, sorry, we get a 403 error, different from a 401 error, because before it didn't know who we were. Now it knows who we are, but we're not worthy because I didn't just say authorize. I said authorize with administrators. 
and the demo user is not an administrator. Admin at Microsoft.com, that's an administrator. So let's go back up here, keep everything else the same. Admin at Microsoft.com, execute. I get a new token. By the way, this JOT token you can evaluate uh, out on the internet. You can go to a site like JOT.io and paste this in here and see what's in it. All right, so here you can see I'm in the role administrators now with this token. Um, I need to come back in here. I need to log out. I need to type bearer space paste again and authorize and close. And now we can go back to this put endpoint where we're still trying to do an update and execute. And now we get a 200. And the 200 says we have an updated Roslyn red sheet with a price of one. So it worked. Um, Cool. Now, that's a good point, uh, a good place at which to do a quick commit because stuff works. It's always good to commit when things are working. So, initial update endpoint working. Okay. Um, now, the question is do I want to be able to update all these different things? And I don't remember if I need to do that or not. Let me go see my thing I'm working from. So there's an eShop on Blazor site here that already has basically the functionality I want. I want to see which things it lets you update. And then that's what I want to mimic. So I'll run this. And it says here's all our things. Let's look at this black and white mug, edit it, and it's going to let us change the name, description, the brand with a drop down, that's handy, the type with a drop down, I probably need API endpoints for those, huh, and the price, uh, can't mess with the picture, so we can skip the picture, and then it has this other stock stuff, which I'm skipping for now, alright, so, description, price, not picture, alright, so let's, uh, let's look at that. Since it's Swagger, I'm assuming that's OAuth and not OpenID Connect. That is correct. Actually, it's it's none of those. It's it's literally just me passing stuff in and getting back a a thing myself. It's not using any of those protocols because um, there's no transfer to another identity server uh, or token server. So it's it's just uh, this auth endpoint right here. Uh, I'm just passing in a uh, request that happens to include a, a password and a username verifying it there and then if it's successful I'm just using my own service to generate a token and return it and that token service is right here and it is using Microsoft's uh, Microsoft Identity Model Tokens and System Identity Model Tokens which is from a NuGet package that gives you a uh, thing here, a JOT Security Token Handler uh, the token handler then can be used to create a token. So that's the code for that. Uh, and this is all out there on GitHub, on eShop on web. So if you go, did I paste that already? I think I did. But let me do it again if necessary. Um, over here. I'll even give you right to the right spot. So in source, infrastructure, identity, token claim service, this is what's doing the token stuff. It's yeah, I mean, a subset of identity server. It's, uh, it's it's not. I mean, it's a subset of its functionality, certainly. But it's not. This is not the same code that identity server has. I I suspect. Uh, this is like, just demo code. This is not production code necessarily. Right? Like the uh, there's a key that you use to generate this token, and mine is just this super secret key that's hard coded in the in the solution. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to do that. You'd probably want it to be in a in a Azure secret or something like that for example. Um, but because this is just a demo, that's that's how it's implemented. Okay, uh, let's go back to our code for eShop on web. And let's verify, starting at the entity itself, that we want to be able to modify all the different things on this catalog item. So right now there's an update uh, method that we use, that apparently Cedric added for us. Uh, and it just lets us update the name and the price. Um, I don't know 
why we're only doing the name and the price, or if that's even being called anywhere. Catalog item, that's my endpoint I just did. Catalog item view model service calls this. Where is this being called from? That's interesting. Okay. Simon says the focus is the auth scaffolding attributes on the endpoints and how the endpoints do security rather than security. Well, I mean, that's not my focus really today at all. It's just uh, something I had to do to get this to work, right? The reason why that security is there is because this is going to be a Blazor WebAssembly uh, client. And Blazor WebAssembly, if you're going to do any auth, it has to be token based to APIs. It can't be pure cookie based on the server um, because the way it's going to communicate is over those APIs. So that's why we have authenticated APIs um, in here. Okay, I don't think I need this. I think I'm going to create my own update methods for this. So we'll leave that one alone. Um, but I want to create a new one to update various things. So let's do public void update. Um, do I want to do it per, per property? That seems a bit much. Um, let's see, update brand and type. I think that those kind of go together. So, well, no, I don't think they really do. Let's do this. Uh, and we'll give it a new uh, int catalog brand ID, and then we can just say catalog brand ID equals that, and then we'll do update void update type int catalog type ID. CTI equals CTI, like that. Uh, that gets me two of them. I want the name and the description. Are there samples of guard classes to write f our own logic? Um, well, this is using another NuGet package, since you asked. And that is a guard classes, guard clauses. So GitHub, com, micro Dallas, whack, guard clauses, looks like this. And you can add your own to this, or it comes with all these ones out of the box. So do null, white space, out of range, SQL date range, zero, etc. Uh, you can create your own like this. They're just extension methods. Um, there's some references here. It's just a NuGet package. It's uh, version 1.5. has half a million downloads, so a few people are using it. Um, and so that's, that's the guard clause that you're seeing. So here, when I say guard against whatever, like here I could do guard dot against dot zero of catalog brand ID and uh, comma name of that's my comma comma name of catalog brand no that one there so we can do that right and that'll give us the behavior we're looking for to, to do that validation and then we would write some unit tests for this, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, Faku Rodriguez, sorry I arrived a bit late. Are you using identity or are you going a more homemade way of doing auth? Uh, it is using identity. Um, so at the end of the day, if you go look at eShop on web's sample, which did I ever actually paste it in? I did. Uh, click that link that's a, a little bit up in the chat. Um, you can look at that and see how identity is being done. There's a separate folder in the infrastructure project called identity and if we look at the like the public web app and go to startup you'll see in here there's the usual uh, right here add identity stuff um, and so that's that's what's being used now it's got its own separate DB context it uses for identity uh, if you look at the readme on the on the home page it shows you how to set all that up um, but yeah what was the HTTP NuGet package I saw recently in my github uh, I don't know. I mean, HTTP in my GitHub. Um, I have a lot of things in my GitHub. So, but nothing that's just like plain old HTTP. There's API endpoints. There's various web apps like Regex Live. There's my result thing that can be mapped to HTTP response codes. Maybe that's what you mean. Um, it's about 
it. So I don't know. Maybe it was the result thing? I'm not using that in this uh, library at the moment. Alright, so that was identity. Got looking at that. Alright, let's... Uh, somebody suggested... JF Stern suggested update details. That sounds reasonable. Why don't we do... Uh, update details for the name and description. String name, string description. I really could just do the price as well with that, right? Decimal price. So we'll do the same thing we did here. We'll just add description. Now the reason why these are separate methods is because we might want to do more logic here. Like we're already doing some logic. We're doing these guard clauses. Um, but it might also be good to raise a domain event, for example, uh, which is actually quite likely something we'd want to do here. All right, so between the details, the brand, and the type, what am I missing? I got name, description, price, I got catalog, that's it, that's everything. So we're good there. So I don't, eventually I probably want to refactor this and get rid of it. Um, but or at least make it a pass-through. I mean, they could totally just call this other one. Um, but for now, let's just leave it. So we'll build this. All right, the result type, cool. Melvin. Um, that's all good. So now, before we just run and, and wire everything out, let's let's be good, uh, what do I want to say, uh, disciplined developers, and let's write a couple of unit tests for this. So I have in here a whole bunch of tests way down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, I have unit tests, I have application core, I have entities, I have nothing for catalog item. That's just bad. Um, so let's create catalog item tests as a folder. I mean, it didn't really have a lot of functionality before. In fact, it, it still really doesn't. Catalog item tests. And let's just steal some code from over here, paste that over here. And what do we want to test? Um, where is catalog item? Let's test update details. So we're going to give it a name of update details. That's our method. And we might want that price. That's fine. Uh, let's see. What should it do? Throws, exception, given, null, or empty name. Um, string name. Var. Let's get rid of the rest of this. And let's make this a theory. Let's give it a couple test cases. Inline data empty string. Inline data null for our two test cases. And I don't remember if I did white space also. I mean, I'll check that too, but let's do one thing at a time. So var item equal new catalog item. Can I just new it up? And it wants all these things. That's fine. So uh, one comma one comma test test zero test. We'll fix that later. Uh, really, all we want to do though is so assert dot throws of argument exception probably give me a namespace and in here we want to do this and say item dot update details with and we're testing name so name comma um, test comma one let's say all right so now we can run this test theoretically what if the name should be unique? Where would you validate that? Uh, that's a good question. That would be more of an integration test, probably. Um, let's see if we can actually implement that so we can see how that would work. All right, so we built successfully. Our test failed. And probably because my type of my exception wasn't quite right or something. Show me, the, show me why it failed. Um, in here, over here, down here, over there, open that, in there, open that, in there. Oh, okay, interesting. One of them passed and one of them failed. Uh, uh, argument exception versus argument null exception. Oh, okay. That's, that's annoying because that means I can't use the same test, but that's fine. So let's go back here. 
Let's remember to rename my file because Visual Studio doesn't do that. And I really can't do this as two as a theory. That's the problem. So we'll just make this a fact and get rid of that. It says throws argument argument exception given uh, null given empty given empty name. Get rid of that. Um, let's create a test item. So private catalog item test item. Let's uh, just new that up here. So test item equals new catalog item with, and then let's give it some test IDs for things. Um, private int test uh, type ID equals one. Private int test brand ID equals two. Private string uh, valid description equals test description. Private string valid name equals test name. And private decimal valid price equals 1.23. All right, so then we come in here and we just give it all those things. So it needs a test type, needs a test brand, test description, valid description. Uh, it's, I should probably change this to be consistent. Valid. Valid. All right, now this is, which one is this? This is name, right? No, this is description. All right, I wonder why I put description before name. That seems weird. Valid description, valid name, valid price. And I forgot the URL, but let's just imagine we have a valid URI. All right, private string valid URI equals slash one, two, three. It's a relative URI. Um, there. Okay, now I don't need this item here anymore. I can just call the update and give an empty name that just goes there. Um, but let's do string new value equals that. And then this will be new value. And this is Uh, it's not item, it's test item. Description should be updating to a new valid description and price should be going to a new valid price. All right, now we can run this test and it's just one test and it should pass. And it should show me a green mark here. Somewhere, sometime. Um, what if the name, okay, Melvin asks, where should we handle repository exception if the database write fails? I usually just let that bubble up to the web layer. Uh, there should be some logging and some other things you're going to do in your default exception handler for the web. Um, yeah, I don't know why that didn't show up in code lens, but it is working. All right, so, um, if it's not something you're going to handle with retry logic, maybe using poly or something like that, then there's no reason to try and handle it anywhere else, right? If it's not going to work, it's not going to work. So just let it blow up all the way up to the web, show them a friendly error page, let the user know it didn't work. And there it finally showed up. Um, and go on with your life. All right, so now we're going to just do the same thing here for given an empty description. And for that, we're going to say this is valid name, but now this is new value now going into the description spot and we'll run all our tests and they should both be green which they are code lens is being slow all right now let's take both of these and redo them for null so throws argument null 
exception given null name. We get rid of the new value and make this just null. And then this is there's argument null exception given null description. Now, if we use null reference types, then these tests probably need to don't need to be here right at that point, and it kind of reduces how much we have to actually do testing as opposed to just relying on the compiler to enforce rules for us. So that's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of nullable reference types. They just aren't implemented here yet. All right, so that should work for those. And then what else did we have on that method under update details? If we go look at catalog item, I think that was it. We can set the price to negative. That seems odd. So maybe we want to test for that. So. Uh, how about an arg argument out of range exception if price is less than zero? So let's just create a test for that and we'll actually do this TDD style. So we'll do a test first. All right, throws argument out of range exception given uh, non positive, non positive price. So we could probably do a couple of these actually. So let's do this with a theory. And inline data, we'll do zero. And inline data, we'll do minus 1.23m. And that's probably enough. Let's do zero m. Let's do decimal new price. Let's pass in a valid description and a new price. And then this needs to be an argument out of range exception. And these are not happy here. Why? Attribute. Argument must be a constant expression. It is. It's a zero. What do you want? All right. Well, maybe it needs to convert it outside of there. It doesn't like the M. I guess that's the issue. You have to change the exception type, don't you? Yeah, this won't work uh, uh, as it stands now. Really what I need to do is add a new guard clause, because right now I'm not doing any exception at all. Right? If we look at the, the actual code here that we're trying to test, I, I'm, I'm not doing anything with price. Right? Price comes in, and the only place it's, it's doing anything is just setting it. Right? So this is our chance to, to write a test first. This is the behavior we want. We can run the test. We expect to see it fail. And it's right here with two test cases. Both test cases fail. Um, expected type of argument out of range, but actually no exception was thrown. So now we can come back over here. Let's move this a little closer. Get out of the way. Here. And let's add a guard. So we'll say guard against uh, negative or zero. It's already a thing for uh, price, comma, name of price. Now the only question is whether or not that's going to throw the exception that we expect, which I think it is. Um, but we can come in here, we can just run all these tests again. And wait for it. None of them work. Interesting. Um, what happened there? Oh, I didn't change that. All right, that's that's my fault. So let me fix. Maybe that was what you were saying. This one was supposed to be argument null, and this one was supposed to be argument null. So that'll take care of those. And then this last one, it expected, I expected argument out of range, but it's actually argument exception. Um, and because I don't feel like writing my own custom guard clause for this, there already is one. I'm just going to change what I expect. So I'm going to expect it to be there's argument exception. There's argument exception. Now maybe it should be out of range. Maybe I should do a an update to the guard clause library with that. Uh, but not today. So if one of you wants to add an issue for that and make me do it later, that's fine. It's very colorful. I got blue, I got green, I got red. Let's see if we can do just green now. Bam, there we go. All right, so now we've got some tests for that. Um, and then we would do the same for update brand and update type. Um, but we have what we need now in 
our entity to support the behavior we want in our API. So when we come back up to our API, we have this existing item.update. This needs to be now a series of things. Um, so let's get rid of that. And we have existing item.update details, which is now going to take request dot name, request dot description, and request dot price. Now I haven't put any model validation stuff on those, but I, I should and I will. Um, because it really should be an exception if this thing ever gets something that's null. So let's let's look at that right now too. So let's go to the request and in here we can specify things like uh, this is required um, for that and give me data annotations namespace right there and name is required picture URI we're not messing with price is that required not really but it does have a range is the range what I want of and how do I make uh, Specifies the minimum value allow. Let's make it 0 0.01. One penny. It's the cheapest you can be. I contain a thing with one. What's your max? What do you do if you want to have no max? Max int? Um, it's a decimal. Let's say that the most anything's going to cost in this store is $10,000. So that's good. Um, and we would want to write tests for these as well, but that's at a different place. Now, what if I just want it to be a positive integer? And then I guess range works for all these. So let's do um, each one of our IDs should have a range between 1 and let's say 10,000 as well. For that and that and even for that, right, for now. At some point that may need to change, but for the foreseeable future that's going to work for my catalog. Uh, and that makes it so that I should never get to a point where I'm hitting those other exceptions. All right. Um, in here now, we're going to call update details, and we're going to call existing item dot update other stuff like brand with request dot catalog brand ID and existing item dot update type with request dot catalog type ID. All right, and then we're going to update that. So I think that got all the things we wanted, right? Um, there's catalog item that gave us name, description, price, brand, type. That was everything. We're not doing URI, and that's the only thing we're missing. So that's good. Um, while we're here, let's clean this up. I don't like horizontal scrolling if I can avoid it. So there's that. All right. Um, cool. So that's in our actual endpoint. So let's build that. And now we can test the endpoint. Okay, so going back to the browser here, we have Swagger. We were able to do this before. Let's make this a one and this a one and this a new description. And we changed the price before, but let's make sure that's still working. Let's we'll update it to two. Uh, that should be Update Raslin Red Sheet again, again, and let's see if our token is still working. Good. All right, so that seems like it worked. Now if we go get catalog items and execute that and verify, there's item number five. It has, again, it has new description, it's got the new price, and these are both one. That's what I set it to, right? Yeah. So, okay, good. All right, now, JF Stern, you asked, what if the name should be unique? How would you validate this? Okay, well, where are we gonna get that issue? Um, first, the issue could come from the database. If we have a unique constraint, there could actually be an exception. But we would like to know before that point if it's gonna be a problem um, in our business logic. So, typically what I would use for that is a fluent validator and then I would run the validator to check that. Now I don't think I have Fluent Validators installed in here yet. Um, fluent Validation, and I'm not sure I want to do that, but yeah, you know, let's try it. So let me let me just save where we are. 
um, updated catalog item to support more updates added tests that's probably good and we'll s I don't wanna, let's get on a new branch too so new branch our Dallas update point uh, create that branch okay so let's add fluent validation um, we'll go here we'll manage new get packages browse for fluent fluent assertions fluent validation install that also means separate concern from structure of the entity from rather than littering attributes yes I'm okay with attributes on on the wire protocol for the DTOs um, but I, I don't want lots of attributes on my entities okay so theoretically that that worked and there it is fluent validation um, so I could create validators here or I can just come in here and add a validator to this so we could say public class um, catalog item validator colon fluent validation dot abstract validator of my type catalog item no, it's been a little bit since I did one of these Let's see if that's right now I'm, I'm not sure where I want to put this just yet so it's just sitting in here for a second while I figure that out and well, that's all that just works all right um, I think I need a constructor if I remember how that works and then in here I can do my validation so the trick is I want fluent validation to be able to have access to EF so that I can do my query to see if this name already exists and then uh, kick it back if it does um, so let me pull up fluent validation real quick let's do a tutorial to get me started here bam so I need to add fluent validation there and in order for it to discover they must be registered so I've got to add an I validator of whatever okay that's all good there's our person validator abstract and there's my rule okay and then where's my rule of uniqueness is that going to be covered for me right here not seeing it yet all right well let's just get it started with um without the uniqueness so We'll create some new rule just to test that it works. Simon says, uh, okay, Melvin asked if EF core many to many is possible without a join table. Uh, Simon says it's probably coming in .NET 5. Yeah, as far as I know, I think you still need to have a join table for many to many, which, I mean, it's going to generate behind the scenes anyway, but I think you still have to have the actual entity uh, yourself. Okay, um, so let's jump back up to the top. Let's get what we need for the startup.cs. Just add fluent validation, and we're doing this in the public API specifically. So let's go in there, find where we're adding MVC. This one's relatively simple compared to the other one because it's only doing API stuff. Um, MVC, do we even add MVC or do I just do add controllers? I think I just add controllers. So it must be off of that, which hopefully that works. Um, MVC builder does not contain add fluent. That's because I didn't add it to that project yet. So let's manage NuGet packages for the solution and find fluent validation, which is installed, which is right there. And let's add it to public API and web. Well, just public API for now. So we'll install that there. And now, hopefully, you'll ask me for the using statement. No. Why not? Hmm. I mean, there you are. So, what's the problem here? 
It is an MVC builder. It should be the right thing. So... Uh, I need ASP.NET Core. That's what I didn't do. Alright. So we just want that. Um, I really only want that to be in the web project. So let's find that there. Public API. So that's my car. Install. Good. Thanks for the follow. Just call me AD. Just call Mead. Um, Alright. Now we go here. And now is it going to let me have a using statement? It is. Yay. All right. Fourth or fifth time's a charm. All right. What else? Next. Do that. Did that. Do this. I got to add that. All right. So in order for this to discover these things, you can add this, add transient with feature or by using add from assembly containing. So let's do that. That sounds good. Add fluent. That's already off of that one. All right. Cool. So let's do that. Let's replace this now with this. Add fluent validation, the fee containing, and this is my catalog item validator. There. So now it should find all validators that are in catalog item validator, theoretically. All right. And. Cool. Now we're just going to test that this thing works before we go any farther. So instead of adding any interesting rules, we're just going to add a rule here that says the name has to be super tiny. So take that, back to catalog item, add this rule for name, which it has a name, dot length, fluent validation, has to be between 1 and 5, let's say. And with that, I can build this thing. And we'll try and do an update. And this validator, I think, should just be hooked up. I think, we're, I think we did everything we needed to do already. But we'll soon know. Because this name is way too long to meet that rule. Um, so when I execute this, we should get something. And we don't. So it didn't quite work. All right, what am I missing? ASP.NET Core, Fluent Validation. Add that, did that. Validators registered using this are transient. Yeah. Oh, you know what it is? <coughs> um, model validation isn't going to pick it up. And here's why, because I'm an idiot. Um, of course it's not, because I'm not actually passing in that entity anywhere. I'm passing in a an update catalog item request. So I've got to do the validation call myself. So this check won't work because I'm not validating on that request. I'm validating on the entity now. And I just want to verify that I can run it. And manual validation is what I want. I want to get a validator and I want to validate. So let's do that before we do the update. So var validator equals new catalog item validator like that and that would be a good place for me to pass in my repository wouldn't it um, and then validator we do some logic here if validator dot uh, validate what do you return you're going to boolean are you your result what do you show me our results yeah there we go uh, let's add the model state Sometimes, okay. But this doesn't automatically return a model's invalid response, though. I don't think. Well, we'll find out. Uh, we'll just blow up if it's not valid. So var results equals validator dot validate, and here's our existing item, like that. And then we'll say if results dot is valid, so if it's not valid, throw new exception results dot uh, 
can we add the model state? Maybe we can, re maybe we can do add the model state. Let's do that. Results dot add to model state. Um, model capital model state. Turn a action result. What is it? Uh, Seven so gear and next pair. I'm looking at for our Dallas result. Convert the validation result to an R Dallas result. Right, but the mapping needs a bit of creative interpretation. There's no profile like auto mapper influence validation, so no need to put it all in startup. That's correct. Uh, let me see. I need to back up a little further. Same question was asked in the EF team blog announcement for six. They said it wasn't included yet. All right. Melvin says, some use case where you think Automapper is perfect. So we have attributes and request response, and attributes on EF and Automapper. Okay. I don't think there's any question there for me, um, but all right. What is the, uh, what is the response type um, that I want? Base dot... Is it bad request? It's bad request. And then I can pass in the model state, right? And that should show me my problem. And my fluent validator, which was on catalog item. Does this thing have an option to give a message here? Let me say like dot message, dot with message, with message. Too long. How about that? All right, let's see if we can get that to work. Code with Sean, how's it going? Good afternoon. Is your ASP.NET Core Quick Start updated? Will you recommend buying that now? No, I don't think I'm going to update that. Um, I'm pretty much just doing stuff on Pluralsight now, and I don't expect them to, to let me publish a quick start there, unfortunately. All right, so here, let's go back to Swagger, and let's try and do my update again token should still work. So if we just execute with this name that is way too long, maybe we'll get a bad request, but no. Um, type error, failed to fetch. All right, let's try rerunning the app just to make sure we're still good. Right, we're back here. Uh, and let's just go through the whole dance again. All right, so we're gonna go do an update, do a put. Uh, we'll do, let's go get an item first. So let's list all our items. Try it out. Page size 10. Execute. This is all in memory, so everything's uh, got reset. So here's what it starts out as. There. All right, now let's go do our put. Let's try it out. Paste in what it is. And resonate you know, 2, let's say. And execute and it's going to tell us we're not authenticated which we expect so we come back up here and we got to authenticate try it out we're going to authenticate as admin at microsoft microsoft.com i don't know why that's so slow pass at word one is our super secret password execute that get back our token this is a jot token for those who were not here earlier we're going to authorize, we're going to specify our bearer space token in Swagger. Now that header is going to get added every time I make any of these endpoint calls. So now when I do a call here, where before it gave me a 401 because I was not um, authenticated, now it's going to give me probably a bad request. And there it is. Um, bad request, one or more validation errors occurred, dollar comma is invalid. That's interesting. Uh, that's not the error I was expecting. All right. DevIQ course. Yeah, I don't expect to update the DevIQ course. Simon says, the issue I found for Blazor is fluent validation support info, warning and error rules. I'm looking at how to map that to an Ardalis result, marshaling that via the endpoint over REST API to the Blazor client. So support for DB back server looked up validation snares, like I'm trying to do. All starts to fall down when the REST API hits in the middle without an envelope. There's issues identifying if the error message in a response is info, warning, or error. 
Alright, I have not run into that yet, but uh, if I do, I will see what I can do about it. Um, errors. I'm not sure what this issue is. You guys want to help me out with this? So, one or more validation errors occurred. That's not really that useful. And comma is invalid after a single JSON value. Expected end of data, path, dollar. Like, here's my actual response. There's no dollar sign in it that I see. Do you guys see a dollar? Line number eight. I don't have eight lines. It's just this. Is it the comma at the end of your JSON? Uh, this one? Oh, you're probably right. I'll bet it is. Thank you. That's why That's why pair programming is good. Right, now let's try that again. I thought the whole thing was a collection. Perfect. That's what I expected. Who told me that? First style. Awesome. You're the man. Or female. I don't know. But you're awesome. Uh, thank you. Okay, so now we got that validation. So that was all just to make sure that works. Um, so that we can do a better validator. So we're going to come in here and say, you know what, I really need a repository to do my job. Um, which I'll just steal from where? Steal from update. So I need one of these. Uh, I async repository of catalog item. Copy that. Go in here. Come in say I need that right there. I'm going to assign it to a local field like that. Get rid of that rule there. And somehow I can do a custom rule. Um, but first, let's look up the name of the thing. So we'll say var existing. Hmm, no, that doesn't work, does it? Um, yeah, you know what? This is tricky. I can't do this with a fluent validator. My whole premise is flawed. Uh, and here's why. If, if I want to check and see if the current name is in the database, then it always will be if it's an existing item, right? Um, so yeah, so I can't, I can't do what I want to do here, unfortunately. Uh, when it comes time to do these update name methods, um, it would be good if I knew in here, this is a perfect opportunity to use a uh, domain event. So why don't we do that? All right, I don't have domain events of the type I need. I don't think I have any domain events in eShop on web. Um, all right. Let's back up for a second. Fluent validators are cool, but I don't think I need them here anymore. I'm going to back out to before we added those, just because we can. So we'll come here, we'll go to Changes. We made some good progress. We figured out Fluent API. It was all good. Uh, but right now, I don't need it. So I'm going to just revert back and undo all those changes. Yes. All right. I think for domain events, Mediator is probably the best choice. Um, it's either that. Or, let's talk about domain events for a second. Um, all right. Here's the deal. I want to know before I set the name whether or not that name exists. Because once I set the name here, it's too late for me to run Fluent Validation. Because if I run Fluent Validation and it goes and checks to see, hey, does this name exist in the database? and it's an existing item, which it will be, then of course it already exists in the database, right? So it's going to come back true, and I'm going to think it's invalid when, in fact, maybe I'm just not updating the name. Maybe I'm setting, you know, blue sweater to blue sweater, and it's the same. It hasn't changed. Um, so the trick here is I have to go and find out if there is another item of this name other than mine, right? So... Um, do you use mediator? Do you think code traceability is not lost? Well, it can be. It's that's that's a fair point, uh, but it does add value in in certain instances, and I think this is one of them, right? So you'll notice there's not mediator already sprinkled everywhere through here, because um, it, it's not needed for most of these cases. But but in this example, right, I want to have a method in my domain model on my item on my entity, uh, but I want it to have some dependency on the database. And Simon's going to go with, what about if we just make a service to do this, right? And that is the default thing that everybody wants to do. So thank you, Simon, for giving me the, the, you know, the, the hook there that I, that I would otherwise have had to say myself. Um, and the problem is that if you do that, then your API goes to shit, 
uh, your API in terms of how the client of your domain model works with it. All right, because now let's look at my endpoint for update. All right, let's go over here. What does my endpoint look like right now? Right now it's, it's go get the item, interact with the item, save the item. Okay, that's my pattern. That's my API. My API is all about my domain model. There's no random services or anything. I just I just fetch the item from wherever I need to fetch it from. The repository shields me from knowing about the details of that. I work with my domain model directly, and when I'm done, I save my new, you know, state of my new of my model. But what if you know I can do update details, or I can, I can do these two on the model, but update details. Oh wait, no, that has name. That has to use a service. Right now, what? Now I've got to have a service which means I've got to inject a service here. And then I've got to have two different ways of doing this, right? This is going to call uh, entity.updateBrand or update whatever. But then I'm going to have some other thing that's like catalog item service dot update name of existing item comma new name or whatever, right? And so this is a totally different way to work with my domain model than this is, right? It's, it's no longer the same at all. And what's worse, this one is going to totally break encapsulation of the entity because now some external thing needs to be able to update the name. Uh, and and the service becomes like a special case that's able to punch through the encapsulation boundary. Um, Simon says, I would just do a fluent validation, custom validator, and DI the DB context into it. Yeah, but we just looked at why that wouldn't work, right? That custom validator still... Uh, you'd have to store whatever the new name was somewhere before you actually set the name. Because otherwise, it's not going to know the difference between a name of something that already exists and something you're trying to give a new name to that happens to already exist. All right, so let me show you how I would do this, um, which is not to use a service, because I don't want this incongruity here of, of how we're going to work with the API. I want you to be able to work with the domain model directly. So we'll get rid of that. Um, let's do add mediator here and we can always rip it back out if we decide we don't like it but um, let's uh, go dependencies manage nuget packages and we'll say mediator right there we'll install that and then we'll need some other dependency injection bits that's actually going to go into manage nuget packages for solution mediator and we'll put this into public api and we'll put dependency injection into public api and we'll install all right why are these different versions now i guess it got installed into web at some point uh let's consolidate those to be 802 that's better. And then DI, let's may as well consolidate those to be the same. Okay, so now I've got Mediator. Um, and I already had Mediator in web, so let's just go look at how it was set up there. Startup. Uh, yo, when you see it, where is it? I guess I'm gonna have to search. I really thought it would be here. Um, hmm. It was installed, but I don't see where it's set up. Maybe it's being set up somewhere else. Configure web services. Okay, here we go. It's in there. All right. So I'm going to steal that. Um, and we'll go over here, start up. And paste this here. We are using Automapper, so I could just use Automapper. Um, and this, we're going to use, the handlers are going to be in core. Uh, I don't have a handler for it yet, but let's just do catalog item. For now, just to get me the assembly. So, so 
So we would have to use Automate for twice, once to hand off to the validator and once to do the update. That's possible. What about a catalog aggregate, which will have the collection of all the items and add the methods to manipulate the catalog item from there? That's not a bad option, uh, JF Stern. I've done that in uh, the DDD Fundamentals course with Julie. We had appointments um, on a schedule, and then we wanted to be able to implement things where appointments were related to one another, like whether or not they overlapped. And Visual Studio is just crashing on me. Um, and that's why we added a schedule aggregate was because of that. So this would be like the same idea. God, why are you sucking Visual Studio? Just stop. Boom. All right. Where was I? That didn't interrupt my flow at all. Um, I was trying to add mediator here, which apparently didn't work. So... Um, services dot add mediator mediator you're not gonna work are you let's do this again now I can't find it This is just going to be a catalog item control dot. Do that. That's what killed Visual Studio last time. Um, and give me what? No, don't want that. I just want the, uh, the using statement. So that should be using mediator. And that should be up here. How do you know if I have an i9, Shady Nagy? You just watched that PS lesson yesterday. Which one? Uh, domain events or something else? Clean and rebuild could be helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can't find Mediator, but I thought I added it here. Somehow that didn't take either. All right, fine. Manage NuGet packages. Mediator. We want that one. And we want that one. And if you're not going to work, I'm just going to edit you myself. Nope, they seem to work. Alright, so now let's just do a clean, because why not? And let's do a build, rebuild. Ah, uh, the schedule appointment one, right. Okay, so we still have some things that aren't quite done yet. That's fine. This was just me showing how I don't want to do things. Get rid of that. Let's see if we can actually build now. Bam, good. Okay, so at the end of all that, we should have now Mediator installed. What does that do for us? Uh, well, I would like to be able to raise mediator from inside my entity um, and you can do that a couple ways you can have uh, if you if you're familiar with my uh, clean architecture template it has support for domain events so we do clean architecture architecture here and we go look at shared kernel and base entity and you'll see that entities have a list of domain events in them uh, and then when you save them, they are dispatched. So AppDB context out here with clean architecture will uh, 
do save changes, actually save the changes. So now they're in the database, the save succeeded. Then they'll go find all the entities that have ent uh, events uh, queued up, so right there, events.any, and then they'll loop over those events and call mediator.publish. All right. Uh, Simon asked if I'm using mediator with endpoints. You don't need mediator with endpoints, so no, I'm not. It's, I mean, you could add it if you wanted to, if you wanted the pipeline or whatever, but you don't need it. So it's not, there's no dependency between the two. Uh, and that's why I didn't have it in there, right? Now, now I'm adding it. So we're adding it because we're going to do domain events, but um, I don't want to do domain events like this, right? There's two types of domain events that I distinguish. There's pre-persistence and post-persistence. This is post-persistence. I'm going to save and then I'm going to try and fire off my events. These are great for anything with external side effects, like sending an email to a user after they purchase something. You want to make sure that you save their order before you send them that email thanking them for their purchase. Because if you send the email first and then the save fails, you might be in trouble and you might not even know that they placed an order. But you already sent them an email telling them that it's on the way. Um, now in our case, what we want to do is we want to use a domain event to perform validation. And so we want that uh, domain event to fire off immediately as part of the, the operation that we're trying to do. Um, and we can either use mediator uh, to fire off an event using a publish, like I just showed uh, here, this mediator.publish, or we could even do a, a, a send and receive, like a, a command and a response. Um, and in this case, that might make more sense because of the validation we're trying to do. But let's go back to catalog item. Let's figure out how we're going to do this. Um, it's been a while since I've implemented it with Mediator. I think I think I can just new up Mediator. How do I get Mediator into this? So on this one, we injected it, right? And iMediator got injected into this. Um, yeah, but I can't easily inject an iMediator into an entity. That's the whole reason why. Uh, why I can't just use a, D, a, a repository or whatever myself is because I can't do DI into an entity. So usually what I'll use when I do this in demos, and I'm not using Mediator, is I'll use Udi Dehan's uh, domain event salvation blog post. And he has this real simple uh, static class that he uses here that works well. And it looks like this. So there's a static class called domain events. And you say domain events dot raise right here, and it will go through, and it basically does the same code that you just saw uh, inside of that uh, DB context. It'll it'll loop through all of the things and, and fire off the events. Um, but it's static, so you can call this from anywhere. You don't have to DI anything. Um, let me see, mediator domain events on entities. Someone's done this before, so with mediator. Using domain events with simple domain events see what, with the EF core, that's probably going to be post persistence, I'm guessing. Um, let's see, I create a list of events. You're going to save it and then you're going to fire them off, right? That's, the, that's not the one I want. Um, link, please. What do you want? The domain event salvation one? Sure. There's that. Crowd and plays. How's it going? Um, yeah, so what's the trick to get into, to get Mediator into my entity? Let's see. Domain events, right? Are you just going to have a collection of them, or are you going to raise them immediately? It doesn't show me. This better domain events pattern that Jimmy has from 2014, that's actually the post-persistence type events. So that's not going to help me. Um, yeah, that sounds close to what I want. So I want to have that, right? Don't have the, don't do that, don't do that. Return a domain event from the aggregate to the application layer and then publish it. All right, that's not really what I want. Neo Ashi, good seeing you again. Uh, the site was Los Techies. Yeah, that was Jimmy Bogard's old blog. I think it's still there. Uh, here. You guys just need to Google for whatever I Google for. So there's Jimmy's uh, thing. That's basically the, the pattern that I'm using in clean architecture. 
So this is like post-persistence domain events. Uh, and here he's showing Udi's version with the, you know, the domain events dot raise, um, which is basically what I want to do. So maybe I just need to go do that, but with mediator. Can I do that? Like, how do I get? I need a static domain events dot raise that wraps mediator. I think. Um, I think. Let's see. Access mediator statically in dot net core. Accessing GI container. Da, 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 da. Hmm. Could you not hit mediator in the input? I could, but see, I want all this to be encapsulated in my domain logic. That's what I'm going for, right? I want this catalog item to be able to raise a domain event immediately. And I can use Udi Dehan's method, but I was hoping I could use Mediator here. Honestly, I haven't done that before, but um, but let's let's keep trying here. So let's see. If we have a new class here, and probably this eventually would go into, call this static. This eventually would go into uh, like a shared kernel or something, because it's just it's just plumbing code, right? It's plumbing code that my app's going to use. Um, and we go look at this, and this one has a container, but we're going to have it take an I mediator like this. So we're going to copy that, and paste that, and this is going to be I mediator, uh, right? Control dot give me mediator. I thought it was already installed. You're already installed here. What are you doing? There. Okay. Good. Good. So this is mediator. Okay. Then I can say uh, that I want to raise events. And when I raise an event, it's going to look like that. And I'm just going to delegate to mediator. So. Um, Instead of domain event, that's going to be whatever the mediator thing is that's equivalent. So what is, uh, is that a request? It's a request. Raise a request T. Let's try that. And I just want to say mediator, mediator dot publish T. Uh, Args, something like that. So why are you not going to work? Do I need to await on you? Public static async task. Await that. Control out that. Crowd and plays. Uh, technical question, of course. I notification. You're thinking. All right, let's try that. I notification. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Niyashi. Good job. All right, so let's move this now to its own type, and let's see if we can call it. So in my catalog item, what I want to do is first check to see if name is unique. So um, let's say domain events go main domain events dot raise a new uh, updating name event. And that needs to know the ID of the entity. Uh, or I can just pass this, but I think if we just pass uh, this.id, comma, uh, name as the new name, that should work. All right, now I need that to be an iNotification. So let's create a new public class. Shoot, what do I call that? Updating name event. Updating name event. And it needs to have a constructor, and it needs to have an integer ID. Which is going to go to a property. And it needs to have a string new name, which is going to go to a property, like that. All right. And this needs to be an I notification, like that. All right, so now that should compile here. And it's supposed to be awaited. Um, 
Do I want update to be async? I mean, theoretically it probably should. But, uh, I guess I gotta just do a wait. I don't like that, but let's, let's see what that does. Okay, so I'm new to ASP.NET Core, and I'm building my first API for a project, and it's the first time I encounter view models. Do I need to pass the whole model inside the class, or just variables that depend on it? Whole model inside the class. Inside which class? Are you talking about your entities versus your view models? View models should just be a DTO. It should just be a bunch of properties, and those properties should generally just be primitives or other view models. They should not typically be your actual entities. Although that's not terrible to do as long as it's only going to be on the server. You just don't want to pass it around to the client if you're referencing your actual data or business domain model. Alright, so that's going to happen here. Um, keep asking more questions, crowd and plays, if you got more questions. I'm, I'm pretty sure I didn't totally answer you yet. Alright, so now I need a handler for this. So, um, don't need that. Don't need that um, who's got a sample of a mediator handler I think I've even got one in here uh, handler do I call it that no All right, let's go here to my code I got a repo with this somewhere where's my repo so I get a no that's not the right one um, download a view the mediator sample that's the one so in here, mediator, controllers, nope, movie, handler, looks like that. So I request of whatever. So this is not just a notification though, but let's see, that's close to what I want. How do you get the DI into the static class? Set it up and start up? Yeah, that's my plan. I haven't done it yet, but that's, that's the idea. All right, so public class um, new movie handler this should be validate unique catalog item name handler is an I request handler this is an I notification handler I might want it to be a request handler in a minute but let's do it like this takes in an updating name event and it's going to throw an exception if the thing isn't what it should be. Okay, so we'll do that and control dot that. And this can take uh, a repository of catalog item like that. And then in here, we'll just throw new exception uh, invalid item name just for now we'll see if we can get it to work okay uh, validates misspelled no validate that's the short way to type it thanks Rick uh, so it's almost a strongly typed service locator for one sort yeah mm, kinda um, I, I may come up with a better way to do this but right now the static thing is, is my current approach this, this is a spike right let's be clear this is not best practice code necessarily. We're just trying to get this working. Um, with the goal being that I want you to be able to work with the domain model directly and not have to fall back to using a service. All right, let's manage dependencies for everything because now all my versions of Mediator have gotten out of whack. So let's consolidate these. I thought I already did this once. Everything should be on 801. And Everything should be on 802. Why are you not working? Just do what I'm telling you to do. Make them all 801. Thank you. Rebuild. Constructor had validate misspelled too. No! Alright. There's only some 19 errors. Method must have a return type. What method? Oh, because of that. Thanks. All right. Getting closer. Are you building? What are you doing? Code rush spell checker. 
which I have not got. Um, Code Rash actually was going to give a free license to, uh, or, or Dev Express was going to give a free license to everyone that's in the Live Coders group, which I am. Um, which I think they also give free licenses to MVP, so I can get a free license num numerous ways, but uh, I don't have it running at the moment because I'm generally trying to stick with vanilla, excuse me, uh, Visual Studio. Hmm. Because I'm doing a lot of Pluralsight courses and streaming and things like that, and I don't want people to be wondering what some add-in is that I'm using. Like Melvin. Melvin's like, what's that? Uh, Code Rush is a Visual Studio add-in productivity tool from DevExpress. Okay, we built, which means everything should work, right? Um, let's go into public API and figure out a way in startup after we configure mediator. What's the best place to do this? It almost could even be in program.cs. Yeah, code rush and resharper are similar, um, but, but different add-ins. All right, so where do I want to do this? Do I have a scope? I have a scope here. And I can get a required service here. And I can try and do stuff here. So the other thing I can do... Does it make sense to do it in this scope? Let's, let's mediator. Shoot. I'm not sure that's how this is going to work with multiple requests. Um, because Mediator is supposed to be wired up, uh, per scope, right? Um, mediator, ASP.NET, core, service, lifetime. My core, your scope problems. Do, 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 do. Anytime you use a dependency with scoped, you need to use it inside a pre-created scope. In MVC, it's blah, blah, blah. This means I'm injecting an iService scope factory and then create a scope. It's also hard. Mediator equals. However, in my system, I also has create the scope around whatever is sending the media request, in which case any scope would be injected automatically. So I want something like this. cheaper and doesn't have the performance issues of ReSharper. <laughs> Alright. I think I actually need to pass in the container so I can then create the scope. It's more complicated than I would like. And I know someone's already done this before, so I ought to be able to find this. Right, this handler assumes that Mediator is already going to call into this. Right, my question is, in core, I have this domain event static thing. It has this mediator. I need to give that thing an instance so it can actually do something. Otherwise, when I say domain events.raise right here, this is going to be null and it's going to blow up. So I need to set this before I get to that point. Um, I don't have any way to like statically get to an instance of this thing. right? And it's supposed to be scoped. So, I think I might just be screwed here. Service scope factory. Where do I get a service scope factory? Everything depends on DI. How do I get static access to this? would work if this is a thing. You can avoid that. Do that. Yeah, you didn't answer the question. Alright, 
the service locator looks like probably what I want. Can I inject a singleton? I can't inject anything. That's my problem. Um, yeah, I don't really want to use a service locator, but I'm not sure I have a choice. Set provider to be services that build service provider. Okay. And then that's it. That's all you need, right? Okay, well, let's try this out. So, this service locator thing is going to have that current. Alright, so this needs to go in the web project. Try this. Go in the startup. Just throw it down here at the bottom where no one's going to look for it. Everything seems good. And then we're going to rip off this code here and set it to the service provider. And that can just go at the bottom of this, right there. And that actually builds on the first try. What are the odds? Why not inject it while bootstrapping the web project? Well, the issue is that the mediator instance needs to be scoped. So I can't just inject a single static uh, mediator. And so I think I need to get the mediator um, each time I, I want to use it. I need to get a new instance of it because it's going to be the scoped instance. So I think the service locator is what I need. And so in, in my domain events thing, this guy, when it gets used, I don't think I even want that there. I think I just want to call here and say var mediator equal service locator dot and what's the syntax on this thing da, 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 da. service locator dot current dot get instance of a mediator like that and now this becomes a mediator there we go and then this just becomes this and you oh but you're Ah, I'm so in trouble now. Um, I can't possibly use that because now I've got a circular dependency because the main events thing is way down in core and the service locator is way up in web. Hmm. How about that? How do I get around that? I have to pass it in from the endpoint. I don't want to have to pass it in. Um, hmm. I think this might be a whole stream all on its own. It's me trying to figure out how to do domain events statically in the domain model using Mediator. So it may just be that it's not really well suited to it. I had to delegate that calls out to the service locator. Okay, how do I wire it up though? I really want this to call something that gets, that hooks into it. Oh, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Um, okay, hang on. I got this. So, public um, void, maybe? Uh, shoot. I want this to take, to set a... I need it to be a funk or even an action of iMediator that's going to get registered as a delegate, public func. Is it func or is it just action? It's just going to return on our mediator, right? But is that my delegate? Um, it's been a while since I've done delegates in C sharp. Public action of i mediator register uh, mediator maybe. 
It's not the. It's not that. This maybe compiles, but it's definitely what I want. Delegate. Okay. <clears throat> and then somehow I can set this on this from web, right? So. What if I take this code, copy it, go into startup, and when we're doing everything else, we set the service provider here, and then we say domain events dot register mediator um, plus equal that almost? That's not quite right. So here's like a variable. How do I add a handler to that? Or do I just say it equals this? So it's a delegate. Can I assign it? To type, but it's used as a variable. Hmm. Shoot, I'm so rusty on this. Um, let's see. Assign a funk to a delegate. That's what I want, right? Funk delegate funk to to result. Maybe it does need to be a funk, not an action. Delegate string convert method in string. Okay, what if it was just an action though? Well, I guess it. Wants to be an a mediator. It doesn't take anything in. String, comma, string. Convert method. Configure service collection extensions. I don't see how that's helping me. Public static funk of iMediator mediator. That's what you're recommending. All right, let's try that. So in here, in here, we could say public static funk of iMediator mediator get set, right? And then this code here comes out of there. And in startup, instead of this, we would say domain events dot mediator equals that. And now that's a method. Does it need to be that? Ah, there we go. Look at that. Okay. So maybe that works. Now here, I don't need this anymore. I need this here. Right, perfect. Thanks, Jeff Stern. And now this should get close to working, but no. <coughs> um, that used to work. Oh, it's mediator. It's the result of it. All right, so var mediator equals mediator dot what? Invoke. And then this just becomes little mediator. There we go. So we get the mediator every time, and we'll do that. Cool. And that should build. Yeah, or you could do what you said, mediator, open, close, print. Okay, so all of that to say that when we try and do an update in our endpoint over here, and we try and update the details on this line right there, that when we debug this, Come in here. Let's go to my other one here that should still be working. And let's execute on this. And we hit our endpoint. And we should step in. Step over. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, no. Step in over here. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're in a. Oh, you know what? Did I never actually. I put it on the wrong one. No. Wrong one. Hang on. Let's go there. Let's do 
that as part of our name validation right there. All right. Um, and we'll just break right there. Neil you know, actually wants to know, is it actually a good idea to use Mediator in your domain or shared kernel? It's a decision. Um, it's up to you whether you think that's a good idea or not. It doesn't have any dependencies, so there's nothing like, it's It's not immediately uh, a bad idea, in my opinion. Like, if, if this were like, hey, let's add the Azure SDK, right, then I would say, no, that's bad, because now you're depending on infrastructure and it's in your domain model. But Mediator is just a pattern. Right? It's like, is it a good idea to depend on interfaces? Is it a good idea to have commands or entities? Like, those are all just patterns. Right? Mediator is just a pattern. And it happens to be implemented with a specific library, but you could do it all yourself if you wanted to. So I don't see a problem with having Mediator reference from shared kernel or your domain model. Um, because it doesn't make anything harder to test. It doesn't give you a dependency on a particular infrastructure. Uh, it just gives you an easy way to use a pattern. All right, so I don't need that breakpoint anymore. Let's continue on. We're going to hit this domain event raise. So we're there. We will jump into that. There's our event we're going to create. We're going to raise it. We're going to invoke the mediator. And get it, the thing and get the thing and come back here. And mediator is a mediator. Awesome. And we'll go in here. I don't know why we're suddenly in catalog context, but that's fine. Uh, probably because we're creating the uh, repository that we need for this. There's our repository, which we just assigned, and then we're going to blow up. Perfect. All right, that's exactly all working how I want it. Except right here, I just need to put in some actual code where I'm going to say, uh, hmm, I probably don't even want the repository, I want the DB context, but. All right, so here Simon asks, which is the argument I made at the top of the conversation, but to an extent it's all more code style. Okay, it's like more OO versus how much more functional. All right, I need to use this repository of catalog items, and let's just let's just be stupid about it first. All right, let's just say var all items equals await, and this needs to be async. Uh, repository.list all async and then um, what should I do to check for uniqueness it's really just a matter of if if an item exists so how do I check to see let's say I've got the event ID and so I know the ID and I know the new name that it wants to make and so if the new name exists and it's not on that ID then will be good. So uh, if all items dot any items such that give me some link. Why don't you give me link? That is any. All right. I dot name equal notification dot new name and I dot ID is not equal notification dot ID then I want to throw an exception right now why are you upset with any this is an internal API supports EF core what what are you returning back I read only list I don't know just do dot to list All right, why is this being stupid? I don't know this uh, to list. Yeah, well. I really just want any to work. That's all I'm trying to do. So, why are you saying all this crap about EF core internal APIs? I've used any a zillion times. Yeah, I tried to get it to give me a link, but it wouldn't. Now it is. Thank you. All right. I'm really just uh, spoiled by control dot. And when I do control dot and it doesn't give me the using statement, which is what it, this is what it did before, 
then I, I start fighting with it, trying to make it work. All right, so this can just be a var now again. All right, so verify this sounds right to you. All right, I want to see if out of all the items in the catalog, which is going to include this item, right, that I'm updating, if any item in there has the new name that I'm trying to use, and it's not this item, so it's a different ID, then I want to throw an exception. Throw new exception uh, duplicate name not allowed, let's say. All right, so need to await and then to list. Oh, did I need to wrap that in parentheses? That's probably what I had to do. Um, that's a good call. So this, this also works, but we could do this and then dot to list like that. That's probably better-ish. Again, this is crappy code from performance perspective because if this uh, list all, if this has like a million records in it, then this is going to be horrible. Um, but we'll again, we'll get to that. I can I can pass a query into the repository after I get this working. All right, so we think this works. All right, so now we're going to go into Swagger. Um, this one still has our authentication, I think. So let's go and list our items here. And it still works. And so we've got a .NET blue sweatshirt as a name. I'm going to copy that. And we're going to try and make another one of those. So we're going to come in here with this Roslyn thing and make this a .NET blue sweatshirt. We'll execute. And we get some errors. Duplicate name. Not a, that's actually the error we wanted. Sweet. All right. So whether or not that should be an actual exception versus some other type of validation result, uh, we could argue about. But but we have set this up now where it's it's how I want it, which is that in the update endpoint, I can just call things on the entity, not have to create a stupid service to do it, uh, and still be able to do database-based validation checks. And if we want that to not be an exception and we want it to be something else, there's a few options. Uh, we could catch the exception in, uh, in catalog item. Um, where's that going to be? In here, when we do this domain event raise, we could expect that there's going to be exception there and catch it and then do something else with that. Um, these could return result types instead of just being void, so there's some way to know whether or not they failed. Because as it stands now, this is expecting to always work. Um, and, and guards are going to be exceptions, and this domain event is only going to fail if there's an exception. Um, so really what we need to do is, is do some kind of check before we ever get here to see if, uh, if it's going to be duplicate. Um, because if it gets here and it's still duplicate, it's going to blow up. Uh, it's Meteor, so you have the option to return a result. Yes, I do. Um, but then what do I do with it? Right? If I return a result right here, how do I convey, using this existing API that I've, I've established, right? how do I convey to the calling code, which in this case is my endpoint, um, that the issue was that the name was duplicate. Right, right now it's a void method, so I, I have no way to do that. The only thing I can do from this line of code, which is what's tr triggering the problem, is an exception. Right, there's no there's no result that I'm returning. Um, so I'd really need this update details to return back a result of t, check that result, and then act accordingly, which I don't really like. So uh, I think having it be an exception is is fine. Will it work for non-DB validation as well? Yes, but for non-DB validation, it probably most of the time still want to use Fluent Validators. This is just sort of a special case because the Fluent Validator just checks the entity, doesn't check by default, right? You can you can customize it. But by default, it just checks the, the state of the entity, uh, and that won't tell you whether or not it's violating a unique constraint, right? So that's, that's why we had to go down this whole uh, rabbit hole of, of wiring up Mediator. So I don't know that I'm going to commit all this back to the uh, the master branch just yet, or, or as it is, because I probably want to clean it up some more. Um, but hopefully this was interesting to, to see how this how this worked out. Uh, and we did get it working. Um, I do wonder if this would be a place where I might do a try catch, right? So let's 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 do a little bit more here just to see what could work. So under exceptions, I'm a big fan of having domain specific exceptions. So Let's have a domain-specific exception called duplicate 
uh, catalog item name exception colon exception. That's what I really want to raise, right? And in here, um, we're just going to take in what? What should we take? I guess we could just take in a message here. Uh, I guess I just need that. That goes there. We'll just pass in the message for now and make this its own thing. Okay, so now that becomes the thing we want to express when there's a problem. Duplicate catalog item name exception. So then our handler, which currently is still in catalog item, we're going to fix that too. So let's move, let's move this out to its own file. Let's move this out to its own file. And for now, they're all just sitting here in the entities thing, but I'll, I'll clean that up. Um, we'll go into this handler. We'll detect that this is a problem. And when we do, we're going to say this is a new duplicate catalog name exception right there. Uh, duplicate name not allowed. Probably it'd be good to say what that name was uh, and some other stuff on here. But for now, we'll just stick it with this. Um, and why is that useful? Well, because now I can come in here and I can actually catch that. So I could say, try this, catch duplicate catalog item name exception ex, and then I can do something like uh, the model state thing that we were doing before. We can say uh, this dot model state state dot add model error key is name error message is duplicate name not permitted like that and then return uh, base dot what did we say it was bad request return bad request uh, model state right that should give us better behavior. We just need to take this and put it in that try there. And now our API, instead of blowing up, should give us the expected result of it looking like a bad request. All right, so now we should be able to do that. And this gives us the error. Still has a 500. What did I screw up? I rebuilt. I'm doing a try catch, so it shouldn't just blow up anymore, right? Oh, um, well, no, I'm not rethrowing it. I'm not using the exception anywhere, but that's okay. It should get into here. Let's try debugging it. Wouldn't the statements after raise domain event get executed after calling event handlers? Yes, um, Neoashi, uh, as long as they don't get aborted because there is an exception. So as long as my pattern is that the event handlers just do their thing unless there's an exception and then they throw an exception, um, then it works fine. But um, unless I screwed that up, if we look at, where is it, catalog item, here, when we raise this thing, if there's an exception right here, then these never happen. And since these never happen, the name and the price never get updated. In a way, you have to catch aggregate exception. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that is interesting. Maybe that's why it's not catching it. Okay. Um, very good, Rick. So where would that be? That would be here. You're thinking this has to be something else. So let's just add another catch block and say, uh, I don't know, um, what can I do with x? So string message equals ex dot message. I just want a thing to break on. So do we hit that? You're not even going to let me do it because we're running. Come on, using system. Do you build? 
All good. All good. All right. Let's see if Rick is right. See if it's the aggregate exception thing that's biting me. That. That's not what I wanted. I wanted F5 from Visual Studio. So from Visual Studio, hit F5. All right. Now we are debugging, which means I can come back to here. This is the one that's authenticated. I can say execute. And we're going to do the update. I'm going to just step over that. And we do the guard, we do the raise, we catch exception. What is exception? Um, EX is of type aggregate exception. You are nailing it, Rick. Good job. Aggregate exception, duplicate names. Why is it aggregate exception? That's so annoying. Um, hmm. One or more errors occurred. Yeah. What's the best practice for handling this then? I don't want to just have to catch aggregate. I mean, I want it to be a specific exception. That's the whole reason why I have multiple catch blocks. So, can I do some kind of pattern matching on aggregate exception and then inside of there can't do the right thing? So, this is aggregate exception, inner exceptions. Uh, could have multiple things. Let's try that uh, here. Let's say pattern matching aggregate exception uh, specific exception catch. Let's see what that does for me. Catch exception. Yes, that looks close to what I want. Uh, catch exception E when E is aggregate exception and interception is that. All right, and then you see I said you can't do that, but you can do this, catch exception when this, this, this. Okay, so that looks like kind of what I want. Um, yeah, so if that's still ugly as hell, but let's see what that does. Um, let's stop this and put this right here. Catch exception E when E is an area exception, question mark, inner exception, double question mark, or E is this thing, duplicate catalog, dupe exception, right? And then that can have its own block, and it can do the thing, and that goes away. Alright, now the question is, do we hit that? So let's see if we build. This is nasty looking. Go back to here where we can push, execute, um, step over that, don't need that anymore. Step over that, raise the event, and we get the aggregate exception. And it works. Look at that. We get the model state, continue, back to here, name, duplicate name, not allowed. Yes. Thank you, Rick. That was awesome. That probably would have blocked me for a long time trying to figure that out. Um, can we put the bad request into problem details response and return so we don't have to have multiple catches? Like, a, where is this problem details response that you're speaking about? Neo, actually, I don't have that currently. Right, so... Like, that's, that comes back to what I was talking about with the API for the domain model. Currently, my API for my domain model is represented by this, this interface, right? I have methods. I have synchronous void methods for performing the operations of updating things. Because that's kind of what you expect, right? You expect to either call property setters or expect to be able to just update things. Because as far as you're, con you're concerned, this is just a, an object, right? It's just an object in memory. You want to be able to set its properties. Um, now, because it's a domain model, and I don't want to just have public setters anyone can just mess with, I want to give it these these methods. And the benefit of using these methods is that I can do this type of thing, which, you know, technically you could do inside of a setter anyway. Um, but this lets me also kind of update groups of things that are logically related uh, if I want to. Um, but what it's not doing right now is it's not returning back a result, um, and it's not returning, I mean, it's not returning anything, right? It's a void. 
It's also not async, so that's why we've got this wait. Um, Tony says problem details is from an RFC. Wait, re request for comments? Um, let me catch up on the rest of the chat. So why do we have multiple catch? Um, Melvin, the only reason I had another catch was to see what was going on. Right, so now that I know that this one works, uh, this big ugly one here works, I don't really care about this other one here. That one can go away. That was just so I had a place to break to verify that it really was an aggregate exception, like Rick was saying. Because I don't trust Rick. He's kind of shady, and I didn't know if he was going to be right. But he was. Um, so I should have had more faith. Um, and I'm getting this duplicate exception. I'm not actually using it anywhere in here, but I could. If I put more stuff on that exception, like more information, like what is the duplicate name, which ID is it a duplicate of, um, I could put that in there and I could pull that out here. Rick smiles. You know I love you, Rick. Um, all right, Simon says, can you change the base class of the custom domain exception? If not, then add or where on inner exception type. I see what you're saying. Then that's what I did. That's that's ultimately what this was. Um, you mean loop over inner exceptions to find which model item failed? It's duplicate catalog exception inherited aggregate exception doesn't just work by type. I think you're saying if. If I inherited from aggregate exception, would it work? I don't know. Problem details is from an RFC here. Okay. Problem details for HP. But see, again, this is at the HTTP level, right? Um, oh, I see what you're asking. Instead of bad requests, could I return back a problem? I gotcha. I'm slow. Sorry, I was in the weeds of my domain model. Um, but yeah. Uh, we could return back one of these things that has the details of what the problem is. And that would be fine. I don't know if uh, ASP.NET Core has support for this RFC at all, though, does it? Like, is there a helper for return problem? Maybe? Yeah, there is. I've not used that. Um, can you reduce it to catch every exception when blah blah blah? Uh, instead of exception, do catch every exception when? Would that be any smaller? Machine readable format for specifying HP response based on that type. I don't know what this returns. That's a class. I was hoping there'd be a uh, helper for that. Base dot uh, problem. It's problem details factory. Problem. Oh, there we go. I've not used this one before. Interesting. String detail status code yada yada. Produce the problem details response. Okay, so yes, we could do this instead. If if I like model state because it is nice, right? And it's uh, most of your clients are going to expect model validation errors to come back uh, and be able to do something with it. Um, so the the benefit of using this is that it's a known thing that most clients already handle and already will display this to the user in some friendly way. I don't know that that's true of problem details, but it is something I, I definitely want to look into more. So I'm going to add a to-do here. And I'll steal your RFC. All right. And that. Okay. Uh, and you say there's a helling that problem details. I think I know who wrote that. Okay, um, Coder says you can move the nasty pattern into an extension method so you can have ex dot has duplicate catalog item name exception. That's not a bad idea. Um, an extension method could even live on the exception itself, maybe, or, or you know, with it. Uh, it has to be in a different class. Now the question was, is this getting simpler if I catch immediately on an aggregate exception and then do all this? And is this ever going to be just a direct one, right? Is it always going to be an aggregate because I'm awaiting? Because um, what if I refactor my code and I decide not to use async anymore? Then then this exception won't catch the right thing. So like, how do I catch either a duplicate catalog item name exception directly right here, or an aggregate exception with all this crap on it, right? Those are my. I want to be able to catch both of those, and in either case, I want to do the same thing. Yes, then no. 
Right. Tony says, instead of catching exception, why not catch aggregate? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Then get rid of the first win. Okay, so, right. So we do catch an aggregate exception. So we're not going to have to worry about whether or not this is anything. When. There's only one when, right? When. E, I don't need to cast it as aggregate exception. I don't need to check if it's. I could just say when e dot inner exception, right? Or e is this. And then what? Get rid of one more paren? Maybe? So that, theoretically, that does the same. Crowd and plays, I can another problem. So I did the event view model, which depends on five models. So in the controller, do I need to call them all as models? I mean, I struggle to make crud for this type of situation. Um, I don't know, crowd and plays. I'm not following what you're asking, honestly. When you say you have a view model depends on five models, do you mean it depends on like five entities? Uh, or what? Do I need to call them all as models? No. If you have one view model and you pass that into an action on a controller, it should bind all of it together. Right, and you're thinking the null coalescing can go away. Okay. And then this becomes somewhat simpler. Um, let's see if it works. I think this might be a subtle hint that just returning a result from an update and handling that in the endpoint might be easier. Right, and that's that's my question, really. Like that's why I have results, but I usually only return results from services, not from uh, entities. So I'm trying to I'm trying to be resistant to changing this API here that I was talking about. Not, not a web API, mind you, right? But the interface with which I work with this entity is currently to use synchronous void methods. If I change that to use results, then I want to change it to be results everywhere. And as soon as I do that, I probably don't want to use guard clauses anymore because those throw exceptions, right? So the whole programming uh, experience is different. And I want that to be consistent. I don't want to surprise the developer where okay, three out of four of these methods are just synchronous void methods, but this one, this one's special, it returns a result. And instead of blowing up when there's a problem, it gives me back a list of problems inside that result type. Like, why is it different? And we're back to that same problem of inconsistency. I want to have a consistent way to work with my domain model. Um, and if I do go the result route, I'll just make sure I do it for all of them, not just for one of them. All right. Um... Close to wrapping this up. I want to verify this works before I commit. So we, we simplified this a little bit. Catch this when that. I mean, that's not terrible. Right? When there's an inner exception. This, notice this is only going to work when there's only one inner exception. Um, but that's fine. That's, that's my current case. Uh, if that happens to be this, then that's great. Let's see if we can give this a little more information, too, while we're at it. Um, so let's... I think I just have to hit the button. Right? I don't have to rerun it. I already built it, so do it. We're not debugging, but we should be running. Oh no, we're not running. No, we are running. No, we're not running. Let's run it. And then let's hit it. Boom. Duplicate name, not print. Alright, it still works. Cool. Alright, um, and that duplicate name is dotnet blue sweatshirt and it's duplicate because some other ID has it so um, let's go back into where we're doing that handler I want to tell you hey you know what it's a duplicate of this other ID over here so here close that here's my handler there's all my items if there's any item that has this name um, I want to say it's a duplicate of it so Really, I want to get an item. So, var duplicate item equals uh, all items dot first or default of name is the same and ID is different. Right, that's the one. First, the first one or the default one. All right. Now, if duplicate item is not null. Then I want to throw this exception, 
uh, duplicate admin is not allowed. And I just really want to pass its ID, right? Uh, duplicate item dot ID. And why don't you like that? All items that first are default. I equal greater than. There we go. If duplicate item is not null, there's that. That's all good. And then you just need to pass in. So go to implementation right here, comma, int ID, control, create a property ID like that. And let's name that differently. Duplicate item ID like that. And I may as well call it that here. Duplicate item ID like that. That's all good. And now we come back into update and we get this duplicate exception and we get the add mount error duplicate name not permitted. Uh, name is duplicate of item ID dupe exception dot duplicate. And really I'll just default to this uh, string interpolation. Item ID. There we go. Bam. Um, yeah, so build it. Let's see if that works. Boom. Come back here. Execute one last time. Duplicate of ID6. Do we believe it? Well, it was right there. ID6. Done a blue sweatshirt. So it worked. Cool. Um, all right. So I think that's enough for today. So I'm going to commit this and push it up there. So if any of you guys want this code, it's on this our Dallas update endpoint thing. I'll send you a link to it in a second. So I'm not necessarily going to merge all this into master because I'm still cleaning it up. But what did we do here? You can see we got a mediator, domain, events, working to check for duplicate item names. Um, that's pretty much all we did, right? That was that was the whole deal. So we'll commit that. We'll sync it and push it. And successful. And is this a link? That's not a link. Let me show you where that is. So if you go out to eShop on web and then come in here and find this branch to our Dallas update endpoint you'll find all that code. Um, and here you go. Paste all that in. All right, let me f catch up on chat and then I gotta wrap this up for today. We're gone a little bit over. Um, consider, okay, so, do, 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 Rick Hatter also, aggregate exception may have more than one exception. Yeah, I know, that's why I don't like that solution that I just did. Melvin says, I asked earlier if an aggregate exception doesn't happen, how do we deal with the repository exception? Right. I don't have a good answer to that yet. Multiple catch blocks is probably what I would do at the moment. So um, I think you can do this, actually. I think this works. Can you stack these like you can stack using statements? The problem is this name is going to be duplicated. Like, I guess you can't do that. Like, this would be cool if I could stack these two things together. Um, but it doesn't look like I can. So, yeah, I'd have to do this and basically do this work and then do this other one and do this work again. And then i got to figure out a way to consolidate those. Um, all right. What else? Tony said remove that. I did that. I think this might be a hint to return result. Okay, we talked about that. Um, Simon, you mean validation data as a result? Crowd and plays likes this architecture. Mine is crap. I don't even use repositories. It doesn't mean it's crap. There's plenty of people that don't use repositories, but I like them. They work well for this type of thing. Simon says, I agree regarding consistency. I did results rather than guard clause because I prefer defensive code checking over exceptions, but it's a personal design choice and it needs to be consistent everywhere. Might be better in the long run than the exception complexity. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree. It's just not my default for domain models. And since this is a reference application for Microsoft for DDD, I don't want to have 
too many dependencies on how the domain model works uh, on custom things like a result library, for instance. Like you're going to look at this thing and it's going to be like, oh, I need to have guard clauses and results and mediator and uh, API endpoints. It's going to be like 10 different dependencies you need just to use the thing. Um, so I want to be cognizant of the fact that it, I'm adding complexity to the design with all these things that I might add. Neo Ashi says, typically async processing command handlers are void, so using domain events to notify callers of errors is one of the patterns used here. Just domain events to notify callers of errors. Yeah, as exceptions, right? That's what you're saying? That's that's what I'm doing. Uh, because there's no other back channel, right? If you're returning void, there's no other way to get information back other than raising an exception. Uh, more info on problem details there. That's handy. I'll steal that. Copy link. Paste in here. Okay. Um, Jeff Stern, hooray. Arkix, hello. Hello. Uh, getting ready to wrap it up here. Dalek asks, are you developing REST API or what? Yes, and I think I sent the link. Yeah, I sent the link to what we were working on. Um, inside eShop on web, there's now a public API project that has a bunch of endpoints, and that's what we were working with. Uh, you will clean and commit to master? I hope so. Um, what's up? Uh, wrap it up. Uh, Jeff Stern, once again, thank you very much. You feel a little guilty. I don't know. Guilty of what? Just tell, everybody tell your boss that you need to bring me in to teach people like a, a workshop remotely, and then you don't feel guilty for all my free time that I give you on these Fridays. Um, catchbox can call private methods. Yes, that's true. So if I wanted to have two catchboxes and both call one method, that would be fine. Um, I don't want to do that because it just adds more crap. But, but that is my my thought as well. I could do that. Niwashi, rephrasing. When implementation has async processing of commands and avoid handle async handler, one way to send back error or results to callers or consumers is through domain events. I'm not following that. Where? Where would I? How would I do that? What are you, what are you saying? Rick Hatter says sharpening the saw. Yep, this is practice. Practice for me too, right? Like I'm learning here as I do this. When implementation has async processing of commands and avoid handle async handlers, which we do, right? We have void uh, here. This is a this is a void handle async handler, right? One way to send back error or results to callers is domain events. That part I don't get. So how how from here do I use a domain event? I'm already in a handler for a domain event. So how do I pass? Melvin asks if I do private workshops. Yes, uh, I have lo lots of corporate clients I do private workshops for. Uh, before COVID, I would be traveling and doing like three, four day workshops on site uh, for companies, um, customized whatever whatever agenda, talking about DDD, design patterns, testing, quality code, clean architecture, ASP.NET Core, any of that stuff, the type, type of thing I typically talk about on these streams. Um, and I have a few people that work for me, so. They, they cover some other things too, like uh, Angular and more client-side development, uh, things like that. So if, if they if the company also needed that. So, all right, Neoashi. My comment was generic and specific to the implementation you're highlighting right now. Okay, good. Uh, I'm still not sure I'm clear on it, but that's, that's okay. Maybe we'll discuss it another time. Um, all right, so let me go uh, for an individual. I mean, it, it, there's an affordability concern there, uh, if you're an individual and you want to learn from me more than just uh, for free here on Fridays, um, I have pitched this numerous times on, on my stream, but I have a private uh, professional career, developer career mentoring group uh, through this Dev Better thing. And it's a couple hundred bucks a month, or you can buy a year for uh, like two grand, so you get like two months free. Um, and then it's, you know, we, we have group live group Q&A meetings where we address whatever anyone wants to and then we uh we have a, a discord where throughout the week people can ask questions discuss uh and it's a good group of people there's like about 10 of us typically um if you stay a member for two years then you become alumni and you don't have to pay anymore and you just stay a member so you know you kind of graduate out of the the paid part portion and then become a uh you know figure if you lasted two years you've you've got enough to share with new members coming in um and it's sort of a way to pay it forward there but this is something i do that it's not free because i want people to be 
dedicated to it, right? So that they'll take it seriously and, and uh, pay attention. And also it's, it's, it's consuming up my time, right? So it's time I could be doing workshops or plural site courses or other things. Uh, I'm devoting time to this instead to try and help individuals that, that want more of a hands-on relationship um, on an ongoing basis, not a, not a one and done, you know, workshop or something. Yeah, so that's devbetter.com. Um, here. And occasionally I build this website on the stream. So the, uh, the actual source code for this, if you click the little GitHub guy up here, um, you can see where the, where the source code for everything is. And occasionally I'm, you know, working on this on my streams as well. And there's, there's usually a couple dev better folks in the crowd, uh, on, on the stream. So, all right, so there's that. Let's go back to live coders, uh, and find somebody to raid twitch.tv slash team slash live coders. This is a mother that won't uh, hassle you about grand... Quiet. Um, Instafluff, MP Crump, I wonder how long he's going to be on there. Uh, can I get there? I can get there. Get past this ad. I think he... Is that a schedule? Where's a schedule? Schedule. Friday, 9 a.m. to noon. Is it at 9 a.m. noon Eastern time? Okay, he started at noon, same as me. So he's probably getting ready to wrap up. But, you know what? We'll just raid him anyway. So if this ad ever stops, I will go to my twitch.tv thing. There's there's Michael. Alright, we're gonna we're gonna raid him. Everybody get ready. So Twitch where's my button? Stream manager. There. MB Crump, right? Raid channel. Pick a channel that I follow. I don't follow him. I should follow him. There he is. And thanks everybody. Have a good weekend. Have a nice holiday weekend. Go say hi to Michael. See what he's working on before you take off though, alright? Um, I'll talk to you later. So we're going to start the raid. It's going to start in five, four, three, two, one, go. Bam. <laughs>